Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England, and our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. Now, whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. Now, these podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us to build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them and tell us what you think. These are debates that we all need to be part of. Now, my guest today is possibly the most important economist no one has heard of, Michael Hudson. He has had a remarkable career working first as a practical or reality-based economist, working for a variety of institutions in New York, looking at how banks really behave. He worked um, as a balance of payments economist for David Rockefeller at Chase Manhattan, worked for Herman Kahn at the Hudson Institute, and also advised the US State Department on how they could continue funding the Vietnam War when the gold was running out. Today, he advises the Chinese government on how to maintain an industrial economy and avoid the traps that the US economy, having adopted what, what he describes as a financial economy basis, has fallen into. Now, Michael's most famous work is super imperialism, the economic strategy of American empire. But he's also written extensively on ancient economies in the Near East, and he's one of our longest running writers, having co written the soon to be re released A Philosophy for a Fair Society with the late George Miller and Chris Feeder. Incidentally, that book is a great introduction to his whole body of work. Now, in this two part interview, we get into some of the ideas in his new book, The Destiny of Civilization, Financial Capitalism industrial capitalism or socialism and in part two we look at the impact of his book super imperialism which charts the dollarization of the world economy through the 1960s to today and now the rapidly accelerating de-dollarization due to u.s actions against russia and china forcing economies to stop using the dollar um, due to the danger of having it confiscated now there's some meaty topics but i promise it's worth your time so let's get into the interview Michael, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's good to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so, Michael, um, I think you have one of the probably the most extraordinary upbringings and journeys into economics. Um, I just wonder if you can give our listeners just some sense of how you got from being the, the godson of Leon Trotsky all the way to what I consider to be probably the most important economist in the world today. Uh, there's no uh, direct causality there that could have been anticipated. I never uh, studied e economics in uh, college because I went to school at the University of Chicago, where uh, the, we knew that there were some students at the university who were at the business school, and uh, they were so such strange people that we never even thought of going uh, uh, near them. It was, there was something otherworldly about them, something abstract. So my degree was in uh, German history and uh, history of culture, because the head of the history of culture department was uh, uh, Jürgen Jalas, uh, and he was a German professor. And in, uh, at the time, my intention was to become a musician, and I had to learn German in order to uh, read the works of Heinrich Schenker uh, in music theory. Uh, my teachers uh, were, were German, uh, and in the history of culture, most of the uh, books that I was reading were uh, were all in German, and uh, the German professors were also head of the comparative literature department and uh, other departments, and it was just, uh, uh, it meant that I could take all the courses cafeteria style at the university that I wanted. So uh, then I uh, had to go to work uh, when I graduated, uh, went to work for a while for uh, uh, the public uh, relations person for a uh, technical society a publisher near uh, a block away from the university, uh, and then went to work for Free Press that was headed by Jerry Kaplan, uh, who was a, uh, a Trotskyist, a follower of Mac Shackman. And uh, he uh, wanted to send me to New York to help set up Free Press there. Uh, when I came to New York, right after I came to New York, uh, Trotsky's widow died, and uh, Mac Shackman was the executor of her estate. and. Uh, uh, he thought I should go into publishing by myself. And I'd already had the copyrights for George Lukács, the Hungarian uh, Marxist. And uh, uh, I thought tried to get funding for a publishing company with Trotsky's works and other works. I'd been writing a history of uh, 
uh, music and art uh, uh, theory. And uh, needless to say, I didn't get any funding because nobody was uh, at all interested in uh, publishing the works of Trotsky. I even tried to get Dwight Eisenhower to write the introduction to his uh, military papers. Uh, wouldn't work. So I, I uh, happened to meet the uh, uh, father of uh, a girlfriend of one of my uh, schoolmates, Gavin McFadgen, uh, and his name was Terence McCarthy. And uh, he was the first American translator of uh, the first history of economic thought that was written. And that was Karl Marx's Theories of Surplus Value, where he reviews the whole uh, of classical economics. And uh, he said he would uh, uh, help uh, guide me in economic uh, thinking. I'd uh, get a PhD in economics, and go to work on Wall Street, the CEO of the world work. And, uh, uh, if, but I had to read all of the, bi uh, the bibliography in Marx's Theory of the Surplus Value. So uh, I had to begin buying the books uh, and uh, uh, ended up working with uh, one of the reprinters, uh, Gus Kelly, uh, who was reprinting many of the classical economists. Uh, he was a, uh, uh, a socialist uh, publisher. And uh, there were other dealers uh, in America, Samuel M. Barris, uh, Sidney Melman. Uh, and I began buying all of the 19th century classical uh, economic books uh, now that I could since that was the only way that I could get copies. And uh, there was very little uh, appearance in classical economics in school. Uh, I had to take half classes in the evening. Uh, I, I began by working uh, at a bank uh, for three years, the Savings Banks Trust Company, which was the central bank, a commercial bank, but the commercial bank acting as a central bank for the savings banks that in America finance uh, uh, mortgages. Uh, all of your, all of the savings are reinvested in mortgages. So for three years, my job was to track the real estate mar uh, market, uh, the mortgage market, uh, interest rates, uh, the funding of mortgages, the, uh, the growth of assets by uh, the savings banks. And that was compound interest. Uh, uh, all of the growth in savings in the New York savings banks in the early 1960s were uh, the crediting of dividends. So you'd have a step function like that, all going up exponentially. There was hardly any new saving. It's as if you just left the given amount of savings in, in 1945, and let uh, the amount of savings rise exponentially. And then all of this increase in savings was recycled into the real estate market. Uh, and the uh, uh, New York banks uh, wanted to uh, extend their market, so they couldn't just keep bidding up New York prices. So they won the right to lend out of state. Uh, they wanted to lend to Florida, uh, especially. And so you had, uh, I, my job was basically seeing that uh, real estate prices were whatever a bank would lend. And at that time uh, in America, banks uh, would uh, not lend you a mortgage if the debt service exceeded 25% of your income. Uh, and you had to put down uh, usually 30% of the down payment, but possibly 10%. So it, uh, housing was affordable. You could buy a really nice house for uh, you know 20 or 30 thousand dollars. Now it costs 200 thousand to buy just a, a one room apartment in, uh, in a in a condominium. But uh, I bought a house for uh, one dollar down, uh, uh, ostensibly for I took it was 45 thousand dollars. Uh, I took out a mortgage from Chase for half the price, uh, and uh, uh, the other half was a purchase money mortgage. So it was easy. Anybody could get a house uh, in New York at that time. And housing was still affordable. Well, after uh, uh, I finished my uh, PhD uh, studies, courses, I changed jobs. And my real interest at the time was international finance, the balance of payments. So I went to work at Chase Manhattan as their balance of payments economist. This is at a time when uh, balance of payments, uh, economics, and really balance sheet analysis was not taught in, uh, in schools. It was uh, very specialized. Uh, and I realized when I went through uh, the training that uh, what I learned, especially in monetary theory, had nothing to do at all with uh, what I was learning in practice. For instance, uh, in the monetary, uh, Theory. They were. That was the era of uh, Milton Friedman, 
uh, in the 60s and 70s with a m money theory. And he thought that uh, when you uh, create more money, it increases consumer prices. Well, I thought that uh, uh, that obviously was not uh, how things worked at all. Uh, when banks create money, uh, they, uh, they don't lend for people to spend. There are a few personal loans uh, for spending, but almost always 80% of bank loans in America, as in uh, England, are mortgage loans. They lend against property already in place. Uh, they were, uh, they uh, also lend for corporate mergers and acquisitions. And by the 1980s, this meant corporate takeovers. Uh, they lend to increase asset prices, not consumer prices. And just to show you uh, before we go on, uh, the, the, the problem is that you could say that money creation actually lowers consumer prices because of all the bank credit creation, most of it, 80% uh, is to increase housing prices, then uh, banks in order to increase their loan market will lend more and more and more money against uh, every uh, piece of real estate, whether it's a, a residential real estate or commercial uh, property ownership. And uh, uh, pretty soon, as you know, that by uh, 2008, uh, you could buy property with no money down at all and take a 100% mortgage, sometimes even 102 or 103%, so you'd have enough money to pay the closing fees. And uh, the government then said, uh, instead of limiting the amount of uh, money that a bank could lend uh, against income, uh, the proportion of income devoted to uh, mortgage service that was federally guaranteed increased to 43%. Well, that's a lot more than 25%. That's 18% uh, of uh, personal income more in uh, 2008 than uh, in the 1960s had to go simply to pay mortgage interest in order uh, to, get, uh, uh, to get a house. So I realized that this was deflationary. The more money you had to spend on uh, mortgage uh, interest to buy a house as, the, as land and uh, uh, real estate was financialized, the less you had to spend on goods and services. And this was one of the big problems that was slowing uh, the economy down. Well, uh, it was obvious that uh, to me that the uh, that rent was being turned into interest. And that was the, the phrase that was used. Rent is for paying interest. If I, uh, I talked about uh, 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 with various developers about buying buildings, they said, well, we don't, uh, we try to buy our buildings without any money at all. Uh, the banks will lend us the money to buy a building and they calculate how much is your rental income going to be? Okay, that rental income will carry how much of a bank loan at a given percentage, and we calculate how much of a given uh, bank loan this uh, rental income will do, and we'll lend you the money in it. So uh, basically, the rent was financialized, and uh, the, turned, the role that was uh, played in the 19th century by landlords uh, uh, is now uh, played by banks. In the 19th century, the problem was uh, absentee landlords uh, were the heirs of the uh, warlords who conquered uh, England or other uh, European countries in the Middle Ages uh, had a hereditary rent. Well, now uh, rent has been uh, uh, democratized, but it's been democratized on credit because obviously uh, the only way that if you're a wage earner uh, or an investor that you can afford to buy a whole building is on credit, and uh, all of us and uh, that that is transformed finance. Uh, uh, it has transformed real estate into a financial vehicle. So that uh, that's what rent is for paying interest means. So uh, I found that there's a symbiotic sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. The fire sector uh, is basically the uh, central uh, driver uh, of the economy. And it's basically a financialized economy, very active lobbyists. Uh, most uh, policy is made a real estate tax policy in America is made at the local level uh, these days because the financial sector after uh, uh, the income tax was uh, introduced and after World War I basically has made commercial real estate tax exempt by uh, the pretense that buildings depreciate in value instead of rise, rise in price. 
the, the pretense that they uh, wear out, even though uh, normal uh, landlords pay about 10% of the rent uh, income for repairs and uh, uh, upgrades and uh, to, to keep the building from wearing out. Uh, so that uh, today in New York, and I'm sure in London too, uh, the older a building is, the better it's uh, built as the uh, real estate interests, the uh, developers have uh, dumbed down and uh, basically crapified uh, building codes so that uh, the newer the building, the worse it's and more shoddily it's built. Uh, uh, they call shoddy buildings luxury real estate, meaning it's built with uh, really not very thick walls. And uh, I think the junkiest building in New York is Trump, Trump Towers, which is sort of the, uh, uh, the model of shoddiness, which uh, they call luxury and it's very high price. So, so basically, I, I saw the importance of finance and, and real estate. None of that was discussed at, at the, in the university at all. Uh, the pretense is that uh, money is created by banks lending to people who build uh, factories and uh, employ labor uh, to produce more. And somehow uh, credit is all productive because it finances uh, uh, productive uh, investment. Well, that, that was the hope in the 19th century. Uh, and it actually was the reality uh, in Germany and in Central uh, Europe uh, where you had uh, banking uh, becoming uh, industrialized. And, uh, you, but after World War II, uh, all of this stopped. You had uh, a snap back into the Anglo-Dutch-American kind of banking, which was really just uh, merchant banking. It was banking to lend against, uh, against uh, assets already uh, in place. So I, uh, I realized that the story of uh, this, the statistics that I worked on were the exact opposite of uh, uh, what I was taught. And uh, I simply uh, uh, had to uh, go through the motions of uh, uh, going to the orals and writing about this. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on the history of economic, of, uh, economic thought because uh, anything that I'd write about the modern economy uh, would simply drive uh, the professors nutty. Uh, needless to say, none of the academic professors I had had ever actually worked in the real world. And it was all very uh, uh, theoretical. So that basically is, uh, is how I came to uh, realize that the uh, whole 19th century fight for 100 years, we can call it the long 19th century, from the French Revolution all the way up to World War I, from the French physiocrats to Adam Smith to uh, Ricardo and Malthus and John Stuart Mill, then to Marx and uh, Simon Patton and uh, Thorstein Veblen, uh, the whole, the essence of classical economics was its value and price theory. And uh, the, I, the whole purpose of value and price theory was to define the excess of market price over actual cost value. And that uh, difference was economic rent. So the whole essence of classical economics had a political uh, campaign and the political campaign was, uh, was uh, that of industrial capitalism. And it was a radical campaign. Industrial capitalism was radical because it realized that in order to make uh, Britain or France or Germany or any country competitive with other countries, you had to get rid of the landlord class and its demands for economic rent. Uh, and you had to get rid of monopolies and economic rent. You had to get rid of all uh, payments of income that were not necessary for production to take place. All elements, you wanted to bring prices in line with the actual cost value of production and not include this rake off to unproductive uh, investment, unproductive labor. And that was economic, uh, that was land rent, monopoly rent, and financial interest charges. Those were the, uh, the three categories of rent that were the focus of all, all of classical uh, economics at the time. And that led to a political uh, a reform. How do you get rid of the landlord class? Well, you don't simply say they're not necessary because uh, the landlord class says, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, the, uh, uh, the proponents of industrial capitalism said, we've got to, uh, politic uh, given the constitution of England, France, America, we've got to have uh, uh, the electoral, the government power pass 
laws to free economies from economic rent. And in order to do that, we need democratic reform. We need to build up in England, you had to build up the uh, House of Commons over the, uh, uh, the House of Lords. And the, uh, this became a constitutional crisis in 1909 and 1910, when uh, uh, the House of, of uh, the Commons uh, Parliament passed a, uh, uh, a land tax, and that was rejected, as I'm sure you know, by the House of Lords. And uh, uh, the re crisis was resolved by saying the Lords could never again uh, reject a revenue act passed by the uh, House of Commons. So that political reform was uh, part and parcel with the uh, economic theory uh, defining uh, rent as the, uh, uh, what is the unnecessary cost uh, of, of production. Well, this seemed to be uh, very, very uh, productive, and, uh, but it, it began to falter. Already by 1848, when you had revolutions in almost every uh, European country, and uh, the revolutions really were not fully democratic in the sense of they, they weren't really uh, for labor, wage labor, which was the bulk of uh, society. It was uh, a sort of a bourgeois revolution. It, it was all for land reform. It was all for getting rid of the landed aristocracy and the special privileges that the aristocracy held, uh, but it was to, uh, uh, they were not very interested in uh, reforms of uh, uh, helping consumers, helping labor's working conditions, uh, shortening uh, the work week, shortening the work day, uh, uh, promoting uh, safety. Uh, there was nothing really about uh, uh, public health or public uh, social infrastructure sp spending. So uh, things began to falter by 1848. They still made progress through the balance of the uh, 19th century. And by the time World War I broke out in uh, 1914, uh, it, it looked like the world was moving towards socialism. And uh, almost everybody in the 19th century across the political spectrum, whatever you were doing, that was called socialism. Uh, and socialism meant essentially you collect uh, uh, the economic rent and you get rid of the landlords and getting rid of the aristocracy uh, would create a viable industrial uh, economy. So you had uh, libertarian socialism, you had uh, uh, Marxist socialism, you had anarchist socialism, you had industrial socialism, you had Christian socialism, there were, uh, you could have a, a bookshelf of books all with this and everybody wanted, that was uh, a label that uh, everybody was looking at. The question is, what kind of socialism uh, were you going, going to have? And uh, in a way, that was uh, uh, what World War, uh, the aftermath of World War I uh, was uh, fought about. And uh, uh, it was largely triggered by the uh, Russian Revolution which uh, unfortunately went uh, rather tragically wrong uh, under Stalin, which gave uh, socialism and communism a bad name, but uh, it had a good name in uh, England uh, after World War II. Uh, and uh, in America, uh, already in the 1930s, as a result of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal uh, that saved capitalism by uh, investing in public infrastructure. Uh, I can give you an example of uh, the kind of the uh, where theory was in the 1890s in the United States. Uh, the first, pro the first, uh, the industrial interests in America had a problem once the Civil War ended in uh, 1865. How are you going to, tr they wanted to create an industrial society that was going to be a fair uh, society with rising living standards. How do you do that? Uh, without training people. You need to train people in a university. You had to teach them economics uh, and how it worked. Well, the main universities in America were uh, religious colleges uh, or founded to train the cler clergy. Uh, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, uh, and all of them were British free trade theory, uh, a trivialization of uh, 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 economic theory. So the business interests and the government said, we've got to have reality economics. So we're going to start, we're not going to try to reform the existing universities. Uh, the economics departments are unreformable. 
so we're going to create new universities. And all through America, each state, they was given a land grant. And the land grant was to enable them to uh, create their own universities where they would teach a reality economics and they would uh, teach economic history. Uh, and they would teach how the world actually worked. And most of all, they'd treat protectionist doctrine. How do you create a uh, society, an economy that is uh, more efficient than uh, other economies? Well, the first, uh, at the, the first business school in America was the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. And the first economics professor was Simon Patton, uh, a protectionist. And uh, Simon Patton uh, said, well, though, if you're going to make uh, industrial products uh, uh, outcompete those of uh, England and uh, Europe, now what you need is public infrastructure spending. So you need as much of the cost of uh, living as, as possible to uh, not to be paid by the employers, but to be paid by the government. For instance, we're going to have public uh, roads and uh, canals, and the roads will lower the cost of uh, doing business. And every time you build a road or a railroad, you're going to have uh, the land values going up. Uh, and you can simply so finance all of these by, by taxing uh, them uh, themselves. And uh, you'll have public education, and that will be free so that uh, you don't have like today, if you have a job, you have to earn enough money to pay uh, an enormous student debt of a few hundred thousand dollars. Well, uh, if the government would provide free education, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't have to pay workers enough to pay the student debt. Uh, today, 18% of America's uh, national income is from uh, medical insurance. Well, if you had, as, an, uh, as England had public health, after World War II, if you had uh, public health here and uh, a uh, public me uh, medicine, or uh, as uh, Bernie uh, Sanders uh, advocates, then uh, you wouldn't have to uh, pay have to have to pay workers a high enough salary to afford this enormous medical expense. Well, already in England they realized this in the 1870s and 80s when uh, Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, campaigned as a conservative for health, all is health. So the movement towards uh, uh, public infrastructure, towards government spending, was uh, led by the industrialists, uh, not by the working class. It was the industrialists themselves that wanted uh, a strong government into the picture. And uh, the common denominator of uh, politics from, again, Adam Smith uh, through all of the 19th century commentators was uh, in order to uh, free economies from uh, the unnecessary economic rent, to free them from unearned income, to free them from the free lunch, uh, you have to have a government strong enough to take on the uh, vested interests in the, uh, the, essentially the landlord class in the House of Lords and the financial class behind it. So, so just to clarify that, Michael, I know in some of your writing, you, have, you view the public sector as a fourth means of production. So we now have land, labor, capital and the public sector. That was the word that Simon Patton used, that a, a government infrastructure is a fourth means of production. But what makes it different from uh, profits and wages is uh, if you're a wage earner, you want to make as high a wage as as possible. If you're a capitalist, you want to make as high a profit as possible. But the job of public investment as a means of production is not to make an income, not to do what it's done under Thatcher and uh, Tony Blair, not to uh, treat uh, public under public uh, utilities, uh, education and health as profit making opportunities, but you want to measure their productivity by how much they lower the cost of doing business and the cost of living to the economy at large. So if a country is good at that, that they educate their citizens, they lower transportation costs and help the workforce remain mobile and, and so on. And this allows us to compete against other nations who are currently ahead of us in economic development terms, which means that we're not going to be stuck at a lower level of economic development where we're basically working for someone else or they're taking our resources for an unfair price. So instead, we'll be able to develop as a nation 
and by doing it collectively, we can minimise a cost using the natural monopoly power that's in government hands to provide efficient services across your board. Is that your thinking? Is that right? Yes. But they went further uh, because uh, the protectionists in America said the way to minimise costs, it, it con- uh, and it may seem a, uh, uh, an oxymoron, the way you minimise costs is with high wage labour. You raise the wages of labor. You wait, raise the living standards because high, high paid labor, highly educated labor, well fed labor, uh, well rested labor is more productive than pauper labor. So they said very explicitly, yes, uh, we're going to, uh, America is going to be a high wage economy. We're not like Europe, uh, but uh, our high wages are going to provide uh, high enough living standards to uh, provide high labor productivity. And it's our higher labor productivity, shorter working day, better working conditions, healthy working conditions, public health, well-educated. That's going to undersell countries uh, that uh, don't have an active public sector. And Henry Ford being the, the, the poster boy for that approach, right, of doubling his, his, his employees' salaries and, and so on. Yes. Amazing. Right. So all of, now, needless to say, uh, the, uh, the fight for... Uh, uh, the kind of democracy that will free economies from economic rent was not easy. And already by the 19, late 1980s, and especially the 1990s, uh, you had uh, the Rontiers uh, fighting back. Uh, and in America, uh, that was, the fight was led by, uh, I'm blocking it out, Clark, J.B. Clark. Uh, and uh, he, the, he, there was a movement an, which today uh, is uh, called neoliberalism to deny classical economics. Clark said, uh, everything the classical economists have written is wrong. There is no such thing as uh, unearned income. Economic rent does not exist. Uh, whatever a businessman uh, makes, uh, he earns. Whatever a landlord makes, he earns. Uh, there is no unearned income. Well, all this came to a head around ni- in 1990, 1890. Uh, there was a publication, the Journal of Ethics, and uh, Clark uh, translated his uh, uh, books on uh, uh, economics into this article. And uh, it was uh, followed by Simon Patton, uh, the economic, the protectionist economics professor, uh, refuting them all and saying this, uh, uh, there's an attempt by uh, academic economics uh, being so, especially uh, in New York uh, City, uh, at Columbia University, where Clark had uh, ended up, uh, to fight against the concept of economic rent. Uh, and uh, this is really uh, the, the, uh, the dividing line. Either you recognize that much of society is, uh, uh, the economy is unearned income, and you want to get rid of it, uh, and you want to, get, you want to uh, pass laws that will tax away the unearned income, or better yet, you put uh, natural monopolies into the public domain where the public sector can directly uh, do prices. And of course, that was what Teddy Roosevelt was uh, going very shortly going to do uh, with his uh, trust funding. Michael, I just want to say reading your work is something of a revelation. Um, I have a degree in economics for what it's worth, and I wouldn't say it was very much, to be honest. Um, In fact, the only valuable thing I got from getting a degree in economics is that I know resolutely when an economist is talking bullshit um, and that's, you know, when their lips are moving. Um, And your work gave me a totally new view of people like Thorsten Veblen. Um, You know, I got a degree in the 1990s and the only thing I had in my economics degree was his concept of conspicuous conspicuous consumption. Um, We never explored his work on the damage done by absentee landlords, which I know is pivotal, when you go back and look at his work properly. Um, and also in, in your book, J4 Junk Economics, you talk about the concept of free lunch and how Milton Friedman said there's no such thing as a free lunch, which in on my economics degree was all about opportunity cost. But when you look at your work, you prove that actually there is people and there is a free lunch for some people and he's the one who's having it. And you say in, in the book, Um, Most business ventures seek such free lunches not entailing actual work or real production cost and to deter public regulation or higher taxation of rent-seeking recipients of free lunches. They have embraced Milton Friedman's claim that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, You also say, 
Even more aggressively, rent extractors accuse governments of taxing their income to subsidise freeloaders, pinning the label of free lunches on public welfare recipients, job programmes, beneficiaries of higher minimum wage, when the actual antidote to free lunch is to make governments strong enough to tax economic rent and to keep the potential rent extracting opportunities and natural monopolies in the public domain. Well, Bevelin and Lee, indeed, were the last great classical economist. Uh, he, he, he coined the term neoclassical economics, and uh, that's an unfortunate term. Uh, when I went to school uh, as a, in, the, in my 20s, I thought neoclassical meant, oh, it's a, a new version of classical economics, and it's not at all. It, uh, what uh, uh, Veblen meant was there used to be the old classical economics of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and Marx, and uh, that was all about economic rent and exploitation. And uh, neo means there's a new body of completely different post-classical economics uh, pretending to be classical economics, and that is the new classical economics of today. So it was the end. Uh, he should have used the word post-classical or anti-classical economics. Or even, instead, or even you know, I mean, is, it, is it now even pseudo-classical, right? So we know that it's... We know that antithetical. It's a- a- absolutely antithetical. It, uh, because uh, if the root of classical value and price theory was to isolate and define economic rent statistically, then denying economic rent denies the whole of value and price theory. And this is where economics became untracked. Unfortunately, it became untracked largely by Henry George by rejecting classical economics. And by, George essentially was a, became a, very quickly a follower of uh, uh, J.B. Clark uh, and uh, accepted uh, this sort of mushy value theory uh, thing uh, uh, and price theory taking, removing from value theory, all elements to cost of production, uh, not analy- analyzing prices simply in terms of uh, consumer demand and what people want, not analyzing uh, what made uh, uh, asset prices, which of course most wealth is asset prices. Uh, he, uh, George uh, became very popular, uh, rightly, as a journalist, wonderful journalism uh, uh, to expose the railroads uh, in the uh, uh, California, the railroads as landlords. Uh, he wrote a wonderful book on the Irish land question. Uh, but then he tried to talk about the whole economy, and uh, uh, he he didn't want any competition. He said, "Economics begins with me. Don't read Adam. Forget everything Adam Smith and classical economics says. Uh, uh, follow me." And there's uh, he's sort of an early Margaret Thatcher. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, our society or the economy. What are you doing, Michael? You're destroying my view of Henry George, an early Margaret Thatcher. How can that possibly be? Well, I, here's, uh, in two ways. Let me say, uh, the first way is, uh, remember in the 19th century, in order to have a, uh, uh, to tax the land rent, you have to take on the, the uh, most powerful vested interests of all, the real estate interests, and the financial interests. And uh, Henry George was a libertarian. He was for small government. He broke with the socialists because he said, he warned uh, that socialism was, uh, had a potential for authoritarianism. Well, we know he was right in that warning because we saw what happened in uh, Stalinist Russia. But uh, obviously what you want is a government that is strong and democratic, but not authoritarian. And that was the ideal of America. But you had to have a strong enough government so that Teddy Roosevelt could come in and be able to bust the trusts, uh, that uh, he could come in and be able to uh, uh, have uh, uh, in 1913, 14, the American income tax that uh, the whole income tax fell on 1% of the population, almost entirely on economic rent, on land rent on mineral rent and on monopoly rent from the big uh, corporations. If you're a libertarian, you're for a government too small to take on the vested interests and uh, you'll you'll never win. You'll end up like the Social Democrats or like today's Labor Party under Mr. Starmer, uh, not be able to be very efficient. So uh, that was the first problem. Uh, the second problem was uh, if, when George said, uh, if all you have to do is, is uh, tax the land and 
everything else will take care of itself. Well, as you know, he was uh, uh, run, he was nominated as a celebrity candidate by the socialist and labor groups in New York City in 1970, 1876 <coughs> to run for mayor. And uh, they gave him the pro program, you have to have safe uh, uh, housing, workers' housing. You have to have uh, safe working conditions. Uh, you have to have uh, food laws that prevent uh, people using poison, like you don't want to use chromium uh, for cake frosting in order to make it uh, uh, yellow. Well, George uh, threw out the whole labor program and said, no, there's only one thing that matters. Uh, and that if you tax the land rent, uh, the cakes will take care of themselves. Uh, the worker safety and condition will take care of themselves. Uh, you don't need socialism, just do land rent. Well, this, uh, the word panacea came into use in the English language uh, at that time because uh, he didn't realize, he didn't see the economy as a whole. And that was the whole tragedy. He was great as a journalist describing rent and the, and, uh, the machinations of uh, the railroads and the other people. But once he tried to talk about the economy without uh, really knowing much, without uh, uh, describing how the economy worked as a system, saying there really isn't any economic system. There's really, it's just all about uh, land rent. Uh, that uh, uh, separated uh, him from uh, the other reformers. And uh, yeah, by the uh, time he, uh, by the 1890s, you had many of reformers in America who were actually inspired by George's uh, journalism in the, uh, uh, in the 70s uh, and uh, early 80s. And uh, the, the attacks on uh, the oil monopoly, on the Rockefellers, uh, all of this. And uh, they said, what happened to him? How did he, what happened? Well, he became a sectarian. Uh, he uh, uh, said, uh, he formed his own party and said, we're only going to talk about land rent. And uh, uh, he sort of uh, uh, diverted uh, attention away from how the overall economy works. And if you don't understand how the economy is all about providing a free lunch in one way or another, not to landlords today, but to the financial sector primarily, then uh, you're, you're really uh, uh, not uh, going to address the interests of uh, most of the uh, uh, most of the population. And that's what happened. His party shrunk quite a bit. And uh, all down to the first decade of the 20th century, you had followers of Henry George and socialists going around the country, debating each other. Great debates. They really spelled out uh, the whole problem. I, I, I wanted to reprint uh, all of these debates somewhere uh, uh, and have them because it really, uh, uh, the, both the socialists and the Georgists said, well, one thing we can agree on, society is going to get, go either your way or our way. We're talking about how is the future of the uh, uh, political uh, system uh, and the economic uh, relations and taxes that, that follow from this system, how are they going to evolve? Uh, the, re, uh, the socialists, needless to say, focused more and more on labor's working conditions because they were getting worse and worse uh, in America. You had uh, uh, the fight for uh, labor unionization got uh, quite, uh, quite violent uh, and corrupt. Uh, the uh, uh, abuse of uh, consumers, the growth of monopolies, all of these uh, were growing problems. And the socialists said, okay, let's, uh, we're going to focus on these problems. Let's leave uh, the discussion of rent to uh, uh, followers of George. Uh, I think that was very un uh, unfortunate because what George did was pry the discussion of economic rent away from the mainstream political discussion, which was socialist. And uh, uh, I found uh, uh, very little interest in today's socialist movement or the socialist movement 50 years ago uh, in the land rent uh, issue. They were concerned about international issues, about war, about almost everything except for uh, land rent. And uh, uh, I found, I mean, today I find the greatest uh, interest in uh, rent theory and translating it into a, uh, a tax, uh, tax system and uh, an overall economic system uh, to be in China. Uh, so that's really where the debate over uh, how are you going to uh, keep the price of housing down by uh, keeping the uh, the banking the financial sector from uh, just trying to capitalize the uh, land rental 
uh, income into uh, a, a a bank loan. That's uh, the big fight uh, uh, in in China today, and to uh, a lesser extent uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, Fred Harrison uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, brought uh, a group of people, including me, uh, over to Russia. We made two trips uh, to the Duma. We did everything we could to enter to say, "Look, you can, uh, Russia, you can you can have a great advantage uh, uh, to rebuild your industry and make it a productive uh, economy." Uh, what you do, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you want to keep housing prices down. Uh, you want to give everybody their houses. If you give them all their houses, free and clear, they don't have any debt. Uh, and then uh, we know that some places are going to be more valuable than others. Uh, then uh, you'll you'll have the lowest uh, the lowest priced economy in the world because in America the rent can take up to as I said forty three percent of labor's income. Well. Uh, there was some pushback from uh, the, the Russians. They, uh, to begin with, uh, they said, how can you have rent in a socialist economy? Well, uh, the, Ted Gwartney, uh, a, an American uh, uh, real estate appraiser, uh, walked down the street of St. Petersburg uh, with uh, the local mayor, uh, and Vladimir Putin was uh, in the meeting, Ted tells me, and he walked down the street and he said, look, uh, it was uh, I think a fall or winter day, he said, you'll notice one side of the street is very sunny. The other street is uh, in the shade. That's how the sun is in the northern latitudes in the winter. You notice that everybody is walking on the sunny side of the street. Uh, that means that if you're going to have a store, uh, whether it's a bakery or a food store or a restaurant, uh, the store on the sunny side of the street is going to be able to attract more customers and have uh, what we call economic rent, uh, more than the uh, the other side of the street. Same thing with uh, buildings. They're, they're a very nice uh, uh, apartment building uh, in good repair will, will be more than uh, uh, that is near a subway is going to be uh, worth more than uh, something that's far away from the subway. Well, the mayor said, well, okay, I, I get the uh, commercial side of the street, but how do we make how do we uh, actually make a land value tax uh, so that we can collect this? And uh, what uh, Ted did was brilliant. He, he took, he said, well, you know, this uh, St. Petersburg, the layout reminds me of Boston. So here's a land map. We have a land value map of Boston and uh, there's a center of uh, values right near the subway. And then it gets lower and lower outside of the subway. Uh, high to, and uh, let's just apply that as a scale model and uh, uh, roughly go from there in St. Petersburg. Well, Russia could have been a low cost economy. It could have kept the oil and the gas, gas from uh, nickel uh, resources, could have kept all that in the public domain uh, as the, to fund the uh, investment in uh, reindustrialization so that it could become independent of the West. Well, as we all know, uh, uh, Ted and uh, uh, the people that Fred Harrison bought are completely overwhelmed by the billions of dollars spent on uh, promoting kleptocracy uh, and uh, shock therapy uh, in Russia. And uh, uh, Russia did not uh, take that uh, path. Uh, and it wasn't only Russia. I brought Ted, uh, Gwartney, along with his uh, mathematical uh, advisor, over to Latvia, where I was the uh, economic research director of the uh, Riga Graduate School of Law. And uh, I was asked by the leading political party of uh, Latvia, uh, the center party, which was basically the Russian speaking party, of, uh, which had one third of the votes, uh, to uh, draw up a uh, uh, a model for how Latvia uh, could industrialize. Well, Ted uh, brought his uh, you know, advisor over to the uh, uh, the tax uh, uh, the tax uh, authorities and the housing authorities. Had a nice meeting there, and uh, they they were amazed. They said, "Oh, this is great! We can hire a separate appraiser for every single building. This will really create uh, a." a uh, a lot of employment. He said, yeah, no, yeah, he said, in America, uh, 
people who do what I do, and Ted was, I think, the had been the appraiser for Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, which is the wealthiest city in Connecticut. He said, you know, we can do a whole city in about one week. Uh, and this, uh, they, they couldn't believe it in Lanthea. Well, shortly after, there was a meeting uh, at uh, in Boston of the Eastern Economics Association and uh, the, uh, uh, I think the Schockenbach Foundation had a, uh, uh, a meeting of, of uh, political cr critics of Henry George. So there were a lot of Georges there. And the other people who came to the Eastern Economic Association meeting, which was largely created by uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, were socialists. And uh, my friend, uh, who was the uh, assistant to the mayor of London, uh, at that time, Ken Livingston was the mayor of London, and his, uh, uh, his assistant was Alan Freeman. So uh, we're, everybody was having lunch after the meetings, uh, economic meetings, and I, I brought uh, Alan uh, over to sit down uh, with Ted Gortney. And Ted was saying uh, what he did, and Alan said, oh my God, I've never heard of this. Uh, then he, he, uh, he came, he, I've, I've got to come and meet uh, Ted Gortney, he should, and uh, uh, we, he came to New York. We went up at the Ted Gortney's house in Connecticut, and uh, uh, Ted, uh, uh, Ted explained how you make a land value map. And this is to the assistant of the uh, uh, the mayor of London, who wanted uh, uh, initially. They uh, we talked about their hiring me as uh, as the advisor, uh, and uh, Alan said. Why don't you should win the Nobel Prize for this? This is amazing. This is uh, this is something. And Ted said, you know, there are about twenty thousand uh, appraisers in America that do this. This is what we do. It's uh, all their ways of doing it. It's all statistics. You can all look it up. Every city has uh, has a land. Uh, 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 here's the value of the building. Here's the value of the land. Uh, we can uh, we can all we can make a land value map. That's easy to do. That's what. Uh, uh, we do mathematically by smoothing out uh, uh, the changes, and uh, Alan couldn't believe it. Well, uh, I went back to London uh, shortly with uh, Alan, and uh, it turned out that uh, the uh, mayor, uh, the political pressures uh, in England, especially from uh, the Labour Party, that is, I guess, that's on the right wing of the English spectrum, I guess you call it now, uh, they had a real estate company, uh, whether, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, uh, do the appraisal. So uh, we never uh, got to do uh, our version of uh, a, uh, a real estate appraisal of London, and uh, so that we could really calculate the rent. But this is this is uh, what, uh, when you think that this is what every all of the theories of the physiocrats, Adam Smith, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Marx, Veblen, Alfred Marshall. All of them were focusing on this. And now this idea is so alien that from London to, to St. Petersburg, they don't have any idea of how this simple concept uh, can be done because the uh, economics profession is in denial. It's followed uh, the, uh, the idea that there's no such thing as unearned income. Everybody uh, gets uh, what they make. And so the result, uh, one byproduct of this is how countries calculate their national income accounts, the national income and product accounts, NEPA, or the GDP accounts. And if you look at the GDP accounts for the United States, and I've published a number of articles on my website, and uh, they're, they're in, in major uh, uh, economic journals, to, to, show, to break down what is the GDP. Well, suppose uh, it's easiest to see uh, in real estate and finance. Uh, in real estate, uh, the uh, the uh, government uh, Department of Labor uh, Statistics and uh, other agencies go and ask homeowners what would the rental uh, income uh, and, uh, of your uh, home be if you rented out to yourself if you were a landlord and rented yourself how much rent would that be and so they have owners imputed rent and uh, that's eight percent of GDP that's a lot of GDP eight percent. It's very heavily growing. Well, uh, it's not really income because nobody gets it, but they have to do this because uh, they want to de describe all of the uh, income that landlords make as contributing to GDP. They say landlords pro provide a productive service. They provide housing 
to people who need it and they provide commercial properties to businesses that need it. Well, that's not exactly uh, how uh, John Stuart Mill put it uh, when he said that rent is what landlords make in their sleep. Uh, how, uh, how do you explain how productive landlords are? Well, say another element of uh, American GDP, uh, and they keep changing this, uh, is uh, uh, imputed uh, impute, uh, financial services. And uh, I uh, called up the, uh, 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 the Commerce Department where they make the statistics and said, what happens uh, when uh, credit card companies uh, increase their uh, uh, interest charges and uh, credit card companies in America make about a billion dollars in interest uh, a year, another billion uh, in uh, fees, mo mo late fees and penalties. Most of the income that credit card companies make are actually on the fees and penalties. Uh, and uh, I said, where does that appear in the GDP? Uh, and they said, oh, that is financial services. So the, uh, the service of calculating how far the uh, debtors are behind in their payments is contribute uh, that this charge that people have to pay, uh, 29% is the rate that they end up paying. That's all a contribution to GDP. So the question is, what does income and product mean? Well, this again is back to what classical economics is all about. The product is what is the actual necessary cost of production is the product. But there's a lot of income over and above the necessary cost of production. And that's economic rent. That's unearned income. That's land rent, monopoly rent, the natural resource rent, interest, and financial charges. Uh, and obviously, you want to say how much of what a society produces is actually uh, necessary, is actually a product, and how much is a subterranean. Uh, and the way that uh, we classical economists look at things is to treat uh, uh, the uh, the rent that you land rent that you pay, uh, the interest charges you pay, uh, the monopoly prices you pay is a rake off from uh, uh, what you get. It's not uh, all of your income is uh, uh, income equals product. Well, that's not so. Income doesn't equal product because uh, only a portion of that income is a product. Uh, in America, uh, the head of Goldman Sachs a few years ago said uh, Goldman Sachs Partners, it's a, a financial management firm for uh, yeah, essentially- we, uh, we know Goldman. Credit, yeah, credit, a predatory uh, financial firm. Uh, but our partners make more money than anyone else in America because we're the most productive. And again, product, uh, uh, if you make a lot of money, by definition, you make it by being productive. That's the false identity. Mm. So that, that's really John Bates Clark's idea that if you capture or make money, then you've earned it. If it like, essentially, if it's in your wallet, it's yours. And it's not because you're a gatekeeper or, or, or you're the troll under a bridge taking people's money as they cross, which is essentially what financial economics is about, isn't it? Right. Well, I, I've spoken with a number of uh, 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 political advisors, uh, many of whom were followers of Henry George. <clears throat> And uh, they've described to me how political uh, all of this uh, definition of the econ uh, economy is. Uh, and uh, a number of uh, friends of mine have been trying to work uh, on uh, uh, to show uh, how much of uh, what the United Nations calculates as income and product is actually uh, economic uh, uh, rent. Uh, and uh, we we all publish that together. Steve Keen is, is one of them. Uh, uh, there are a, a number of others uh, who do it. And uh, we publish in uh, places like the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics and other things, but not, not the mainstream journals. And uh, uh, essentially, a lot of this was taught uh, where I was a professor for uh, uh, decades. I guess I'm still a professor there at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Uh, and uh, we found that in the, our graduates had problems getting jobs because in order to get an appointment a job at a university uh you have to be uh publish articles in uh prestige magazines well the university of chicago the milton friedman boys the chicago boys control the editorial boards of all the prestige magazines just like they control the nobel prize committee that basically is uh given to chicago boys uh every year for uh explaining how the 
We're not explaining how the economy works. Uh, a precondition for what you call an economist or a Nobel Prize winning economist is not understanding how the economy works because if you understand it, you're going to threaten the vested interests uh, that are getting the free lunch. You have to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everybody earns whatever they get. Uh, the rob it, uh, uh, Robbers and criminals like that idea. Yeah, we got it. We stole it fair and square. You can ex ex extend that over the, uh, uh, the economic spectrum and uh, see that crime pays, but also rent seeking pays. And you can get much more money quicker by extractive means, by rent extraction than you can by actually investing in plant and equipment and developing products and marketing them uh, and making a profit to, uh, over time and spending on research and development. That's why in today's industrial economy in the United States, 92% uh, of co corporate uh, revenue uh, called earnings, uh, although not all of it is earned, uh, that's a lot of euphemism, uh, is spent on stock buybacks and uh, dividend payouts, not on new capital investment like the textbooks say. So the way that the economy works today is no longer industrial capitalism, uh, it's finance capitalism. And uh, instead of industrial engineering, making society that produces more uh, with all of the environmental protection uh, uh, in, in cost included, uh, in, in, instead of that, uh, you have uh, making uh, financial engineering of making wealth by increasing the stock prices. Uh, that, and if you don't realize that wealth is achieved, not by earning it, you don't save up your earnings and get wealthy. Uh, 90, uh, uh, I think half of Americans are unable to raise $400 in an emergency. They have no savings at all. Uh, so it's really very hard to save up money, especially if you have student debt and credit card debt and uh, medical debt and uh, mortgage debt. Uh, there's really nothing uh, to be saved. Uh, so you have the 1% of society, the rentier, Sec, uh, portion that had to pay income tax back in 1914, uh, uh, get, getting huge amounts of income, and uh, the rest of the uh, society getting less and less and less. There's an economic polarization. The dynamics of society are financial, and uh, uh, basically it's uh, rent seeking that has been financialized. I'll give you another example of the GDP. One of the problems uh, that make uh, I found makes GDP statistics meaningless is depreciation. Uh, this idea that uh, uh, buildings depreciate. Uh, when Ronald Reagan came in, uh, he basically this was the real estate interests taking over the government. Uh, the Henry George and the libertarians are for central planning, but they're for central planning by Wall Street by the financial interests. Uh, if you don't have central, every economy is planned. Every economy is there. If you don't have a government strong enough to do the planning, the planning is done by the financial uh, sector and the real estate sector. And uh, they uh, had their chance under Ronald Reagan. Uh, you could, under Reagan, you could pretend that uh, if you buy a big commercial building, you can pretend that uh, right off one seventh of the entire cost every single year. And at the end of seven years, uh, it ends and you have, then you, you change your ownership from one uh, uh, name to another name and you start it all over again. The same building can be redepreciated again and again and again. Uh, Donald Trump wrote in his uh, autobiography, he loves depreciation because he said, thanks to the pretense of depreciation, my buildings are all going up in value and I get to pretend they're falling and that I get to deduct all of that depreciation from my income tax. And so it's actually economic rent. So if you look at the uh, national income statistics, uh, you can't uh, find economic rent in them at, at all. They don't, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't appear. I was able to piece it together by adding you know, what is it that goes into economic rent? Well, certainly real estate taxes are part of economic rent. Interest payments, because interest is paid out of economic rent. Uh, the depreciation actually should be there. But the government nowhere in the national income statistics says how much is actually charged for depreciation. 
they have a dummy because if they showed that, that would get the whole economy would think, wait a minute, this is a giveaway. This is uh, uh, utterly unrealistic. Uh, uh, and so they pretend that uh, we're going to only put for depreciation what we think the buildings are actually depreciating over a period of 20 or 25 years. Uh, it's a completely fictitious number. Uh, and so you have a fictitious uh, 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 type of national income accounting that makes it uh, impossible uh, to actually go and calculate what the economic rent is, the economic rent that was the whole focus of classical economics. So how are you going to get a, uh, a statistical system that actually uh, reflects this? Well, uh, uh, one uh, associate of mine, Jacob Assa, ASSA, has uh, done quite a few uh, books uh, on this, uh, criticizing uh, uh, economic rent. Uh, he, and he uh, works for the United Nations uh, uh, here in New York, or didn't tell quite recently. Now he's teaching. Uh, so you, you have people who are capable of doing this, but as I said, our graduates couldn't, uh, you can't publish this in the uh, University of Chicago Economic Journal because they say there's no such thing as economic rent, just like there's no such thing as society. Uh, uh, now, I had wanted to publish statistics on this, and, and at a certain point, uh, the Henry George School asked me to make statistics of uh, what rent was and, uh, uh, and of land value. And I found out that the, uh, the value of land, the market price of land in the United States was twice, twice what the government reported it as. Uh, the government pretends that uh, buildings keep growing in value, even though there's depreciation, they pretend that buildings are growing in value and whatever is left after uh, putting the, uh, you take the original cost of the building, you multiply it by the construction price index and whatever is lent is uh, left is uh, uh, the land value. Well, in 1994, if you were to ask, what's the land value of all of the commercially owned real estate in the United States, what do you think it was? It was negative $4 billion. In other words, we will give you all of the land that every corporation owns in the United States. Uh, uh, but uh, you'll have to accept the $4 billion that, it, uh, uh, that it's, it's in deficit for. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Uh, the statistics are, are drawn up by uh, the real estate interest. Uh, and uh, when I, I calculated this, uh, the Georgists in America got furious. They said, this is awful. You're showing that rents much more and land value and rents are much higher than we thought. If you did this, people are going to want to tax them. We represent the developers. Our followers uh, in the Georgist movement are the local mayors and local, in order to influence local mayors, you have to, uh, their uh, big funders are the real estate interests in their campaigns. We represent the developers. We want to have, uh, we want to save society by having the developers build up those slums, build up those vacant lots. That'll save civilization. You don't need to worry about uh, uh, ecology. You don't need to worry about workers' conditions. You don't need to worry about anything about, let's build up those vacant lots. Well, that's when I, uh, uh, and uh, I was told if I publish these statistics, I can never uh, have any relations with uh, Schock and Bach or the Henry George School again. So I published them in a, uh, uh, at Harper's Magazine in a cover story uh, and uh, lived happily ever after. And, and, and was that the, um, the new road to serfdom? That I what? The article in, in Harper's, was that the, yeah. the new road to serfdom that you... Yes. Okay. Uh, um, and and it, go on. We're in the new road to serfdom uh, because the, the, the purpose of industrial capitalism was to free economies from the legacy of feudalism. And the legacy of feudalism was the landlord warrior class collecting hereditary rents and the, the predatory banks that were not making loans for uh, industry. Uh, none of the industrialists got their money uh, from, uh, to invest in, in, in banks. Uh, uh, the inventors of the st steam engine couldn't get uh, money. They had to mortgage their houses. Uh, uh, banks don't lend money. For it. And this is all included in your latest book, which has just come out called The Destiny of Civilization, Finance Capitalism, Industrial Capitalism or Socialism which I gather was a series of lectures to a Chinese university. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and there, uh, there are 168,000 uh, viewers of the first lecture in the first, uh, uh, the first week. 
uh, and uh, there's just a, uh, there's a huge uh, uh, interest in this in China because they realize we don't need higher housing prices. Right now, what is pushing up housing and prices in China? It's the amount of money that uh, banks will uh, lend against the property. And if you have a land tax, uh, the land tax will actually keep the prices of housing down. Because if uh, obviously, as China gets more uh, productive and more prosperous, people are going to be able to afford housing. And housing is really how you define a person's status. Uh, and uh, if some, something gets more valuable because of uh, public investment uh, in transportation or uh, schools nearby or parks nearby, uh, that's going to make it more valuable. But if you uh, tax it, then uh, you're going to keep the actual housing price down. And, uh, of, uh, and what, you're, what you're paying for is the economic rent, but the economic rent is the payment that pays for all of these. Uh, I think uh, uh, Fred Harrison and uh, Riley wrote that book, Taken for a Ride, where they show that all of the money that uh, uh, London spent on extending the Jubilee line increased real estate prices by twice as much all along the line. They could have simply collected the value that this public investment created, as uh, Simon Patton pointed out, and uh, made it self-financing. Instead, it was all a giveaway. And uh, they had to uh, end up taxing uh, labor and, uh, and, and uh, uh, business. And that obviously increased, the effect was to increase Britain's cost of living and hence the cost of production, which is why Britain has been deindustrializing. And it's been deindustrializing because despite the uh, attempt through 1909 and 10 to uh, free itself from landlordism, uh, it freed itself from landlordism only to have the bankers taking the place of the landlords and uh, doing being the class today that was what the landlords were in the 19th century. And so we're back on uh, the revival of uh, uh, what really was feudalism, a rake-off by a hereditary privileged class. Thank you for listening to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit our website, www.shepherdwalwyn.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are also on the website. And if you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Spotify to give us a review. It's surprisingly helpful in getting the ideas out there. So until next time, keep reading.